Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll be speaking about uh, this recent paper with Yin Zhao. Uh, I apologize, some of you might have heard a similar talk a few months ago. I'll try to, try to present it a bit differently. Um, so the, the, the motivation here is to understand, to think about gravity from the point of view of quantum information theory and use tools from quantum information theory to, you know, to, to understand aspects of black hole evolution. Um, so, uh, and as, as we've learned over the last years, uh, it is a very fruitful thing to think about. Uh, so, for instance, we, we want to understand how does local space time description, how does that emerge from the information structure of the CFT? And we have a pretty good idea at this point what kind of quantities we should be thinking about. Um, so, so today I'll expand uh, on some of these ideas and subject them to some non-trivial tests. And specifically, we want to understand the black hole interior. From the boundary point of view. Interested in questions such as, uh, and I have this two sided eternal black hole geometry, and we want to distinguish between or we want to understand what distinguishes uh, the case where you throw in um, perturbations. Sorry. So, so we can consider acting with some local operators on the boundary at some time and that creates a, a perturbation or a shock wave propagating into the vault and we want to understand uh, properties of that process so if, if i send the perturbations at these particular times then they would not meet in the interior before they hit the singularity we want to understand how is this different from a boundary point of view from a case where the perturbations are sent in earlier and hence have time to interact before they get the singularity. And I also want to distinguish this quite explicitly from, from the case where the perturbations are sent in very early, so that they're very close to the horizon and they back react strongly. So, so, so in this case, the gravitational back reaction, these, both of these signals get highly boosted by the time they get here. And they will back react very strongly, and gravity will be it will be difficult to make predictions about uh, the gravitational interactions. Um, so, so we also want to understand gravitational dynamics, um, strong back reaction. The behavior of the singularity. Okay, so so can I so is the idea if if you have access to both boundaries, whether or not you can determine the uh, what the bulk picture, space time picture would be by doing correlated experiments. Yeah. So what is uh, what do you do if if you have access to both boundaries? What do you have to do to distinguish between these cases, and what characterizes a very strong gravitational interaction? And I'm going to try to answer that question in, in, a, in a language that's, uh, that, that comes from quantum information tools. And then tag it on. So I'll, I'll begin by explaining this uh, quantum circuit model that I'll be using. And then I'll uh, tell you more about the kind of predictions that makes about gravity. Then we'll test these predictions. And in the end, I'll show some, uh, some plots. Some, some, some nice pictures. Okay, so uh, so what's the model we'll be using? So it's an extremely simple model that will maybe surprisingly make some some pretty non-trivial predictions about the gravitational uh, background. And even though the simple is not new and it's very simple. I'll, I'll spend some time explaining it because 
yeah, it seems to cause confusion sometimes. Um, yeah, so we want to understand how do we characterize the late time evolution of the black hole interior, and, and the model is as follows. So, so the, the, the state we're considering here more explicitly is the state. Sort of the thermal version of a highly highly entangled state, which has the property that the reduced density matrix um, on either side is, is a thermal density matrix. Uh, associate the geometry that I just drew with this state, and in particular, I want to think about this state on this slice. Now. Uh, Matasena, for instance, suggested that the, the growth of the interior region as I evolve the state upwards to time uh, can be understood in terms of the growth of a tensor network. Later, um, Nikolai Saskin and Robert Sample Saskin uh, designed a more specific quantum circuit model, which is a particular kind of tensor network that is supposed to describe the state of the boundary system uh, as we evolve upwards. For a very long time. So that's one of the important features that the state keeps evolving for a very long time. Um, okay, so, so we're going to represent this state by a collection of, of qubits, which I just draw like this. So, so each of these lines is supposed to represent a qubit. So the number of lines is like uh, the, the uh, order of the black hole entropy. And we imagine that the left and right systems hold uh, hold parts parts of these qubits. So so the these qubits represent the entangled state between the two systems. Um, yeah, we need if the entropy is is s, then we would expect that we need about. So if we implement this efficiently, we would need about s qubits uh, to. To model this evolution. Now, uh, here, when we act with time evolution on this, where the Hamiltonian uh, is like the, the left plus the right Hamiltonian, such that the evolution goes upwards on both sides. Uh, what was yeah. If you work with that Hamiltonian, uh, the, the time slice uh, doesn't need to go in the interior, no? because it's just going to, to approach the horizon, basically. It, it will often be convenient to discuss uh, maximum volume slices. Yeah, my, my question is if you are sure that uh, doing that evolution, uh, you go inside, uh, uh, you go in the interior. Uh, and you, because it seems that uh, you could you could slice the, the you could uh, see that evolution by slicing in a way that uh, that, that doesn't go to the interior. That just uh, the time slice approaches the the, the, the two horizons. Yeah, I'll, I'll be more specific about the proposal, which which slices to pick. So you cannot pick extremal slices. And the proposal is that they are going to correspond to operations on this circuit. So what does this time evolution do? So the, the model goes back to tip of my head and the press because I said that you, we want to model this time evolution as operations, quantum gates acting on this collection of qubits and building up a circuit. And of course the black hole evolution, let's assume it evolves unitarily, so we're going to act with unitary gates, but also in an optimally thermalizing way. So you know these black holes are fast scramblers and um, so the, the qubits should interact in a, in a non-local way uh, and they should interact quickly so it's going to be all to all interactions between them so one time step of evolution and the, the scale for these operations is going to be the, the ads scale uh, and each each time step corresponds to acting with some 
random unitary two, two qubit gates on all of the all of the qubits. So each of these lines acts on two of them. Then the next time step, we do the thing, the whole thing again, and just split the system into s half qubits and, and act with these two qubit gates on them. And and you can go, you can keep going. And the, the growth of the circuit, of the depth of the circuit, corresponds to the fact that as we evolve up here, we keep if we take these maximum slices, we're going to pick up more and more of the interior geometry. Um, uh, so so okay. So so the idea is going to be to associate this circuit and these qubits. With the interior geometry, and specifically that they give the, sort of the course for representation of the interior geometry, um, be, because these gates have not much meaning from either side alone. So they, they leave the, the reduced density matrix on the two subsystems unchanged, or in the gravitational language, uh, they, they describe a region of the geometry which is not in the entanglement wedge of either of the systems, but only in the combined entanglement wedge. Two qubits. Um, yeah. So at each time step, I'm pairing the qubits into s half um, pairs and act with random all to all gates on these. So, so, so the interaction within such a circuit is all to all. It's a non local interaction, but, but models the, the fast scrambling nature of, the, of this ADS size track hole. Okay, so so these qubits they have no effect on the state on either side alone, but only on the state of the combined system. Uh, that, that's why we associate them with the interior geometry. And the hypothesis that was formulated, for instance, by Robert Stanford and Suskind, is that this this kind of circuit gives you a coarse grained representation. Um, well, the, the, the gates are associated with the interior. Okay, now, now we're going to consider perturbing the state. So acting with, a, with some operator, some precursor operator, for instance, on the right system. Um, what does that do? Sorry, I should, I should have mentioned. So there's a notion of time here. The, the right time goes to the right and the left time goes to the left. These correspond to evolving upwards here on the right and upwards on the left. So, so the, the entire circuit gives you a description of the time evolution of the state. And each finite snapshot of the circuit tells you about the state at a given time. Now, if we act with an operator, uh, on the right system, then from the, from the point of view of the right, right system, as we evolve in, in, into the right direction, that means at some point we insert a perturbation or some, some extra normal amount of uh, uh, qubits enter the circuit. And this, this perturbation spreads and interacts indirectly with many qubits through these gates. So, so do some time step and then uh, interact with some with the gates of the circuit with some random number of other qubits. Okay. So this is just the, this butterfly effect, the fact that the, the effect of this operator spreads exponentially through the circuit and affects other qubits. Uh, now, the, from the right point of view, we can undo this effect. We want backwards and undo this operator. 
but somehow these, these affected qubits are in control of the right system. So you cannot do that from the left. I can't see the green. I guess you can't see the green. Yeah, it's, it's a bit hard. But you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what else. That's the effect of this thing. The perturbation spreads through the circuit. So from the left point of view, what happens is that you add, as the left up of the, the left system evolves backwards, it scans through the circuit to find that they can't do these, these gates anymore. Um, so we have now two types of gates. Uh, we have one, the ones that I drew in green here. So, so we have these green sick gates that cannot, uh, that we can only undo from the right. And the, the, the red ones that I could add here would be healthy in the sense that they're unaffected by this perturbation. They can be undone by operations on both the left and the right. Okay, so, so this is an epi epidemic model of operator growth. Uh, yeah, for, for obvious reasons. And, and of course, this, this spreads like, uh, like any epidemic spreads, it spreads in an exponential way. And you can calculate what are the number of these six gates that you have at any given time or the fraction number of total gates and you just find the right. so tr is the circuit time twr is the time when we insert this um, star it's the scrambling time it's kind of again. so I'm gonna often I will approximate this by a step function um, which means that, that this kind of uh, Spreading, I will schematically just draw this as a. This is my circuit here. And schematically, I will just draw this as an insertion here, which starts spreading exponentially for some time, but the effect is very small. And then at around the scrambling time, the effect becomes very large. And approximately, it will affect the entire circuit uh, immediately. Approximation, but you'll see uh, in what sense that's good. This time it's experiment time. Um, now, from the This perturbation does is it, it brings out it changes the geometry in a way that I can draw like this. But the horizon jumps as some amount just of the, the grows this just amount grows exponentially in time. Uh, time. So then, so we've added some entropy to the black hole and that makes the, the horizon come up in a way that we still have this interior region that only lives in the entanglement wedge of the combined system. But now there's, there's another part of the geometry here um, 
which is in the entanglement branch of the right, but not in the entanglement branch of the left. Uh, that part of the geometry will be associated to the infected uh, gates, uh, qubits in this, in this simple model. So, yeah, so, so, so more precisely, this was worked out a long time ago with Ray Cook and so on, Stanford Suskin. And in some approximation, you can think of it as just gluing together pieces of space time. All right, so, so one last thing we're going to need is uh, the case of localized shocks. The picture that was advocated here uh, a few years ago is that for that we're now going to describe black holes not necessarily of ADS size, but we want to in include some spatial structure. And, and each ADS size black hole is described by a circuit in which perturbations spread exponentially. But in addition to that, we now have a lattice structure in space uh, where these effects go ballistic. So, so I'm going to draw pictures now that are sort of analogous to these circuit pictures, but have a spatial direction. So, so the, the y direction now has actual spatial meaning. And I'm going to consider this kind of behavior. This is, this is supposed to be analogous to, uh, to that picture in this, in this step function approach, approximation. But there's some operator insertion here, some time TWR, XWR. And its effect spreads towards the right. So at each constant X slice, you can have, imagine a picture like this. Um, and the effect spreads in the causal light cone, but it stays small for, for a scrambling time. So there's a, se a separate cone, a butterfly cone. Um, The, the effect of the perturbation only grows small once you reach this part of my cone. So, so that's analogous to this, this kind of thing. You have to wait for a scrambling time and then approximately the effect becomes very large and affects most of the circuit. So it's called scrambling time and it's going to depend on X because in general, the, the butterfly velocity that sets the slope of this cone is not equal to the speed of light. Scrambling time is now the entropy of the perturbation, and then it gets a next dependence. All right, so. So that's the model, and now, now we want to we come back to the setup I described in the beginning. Um, the proposal or, or the setup. So we're going to consider two perturbations now. These pictures I drew in the beginning. So that's that's like considering a state that's constructed by acting with uh, an operator on the left and an operator on the right. On the TFT, and we want to characterize the collision of these two signals uh, from the boundary point of view. So, so how can we do this? How, what, so, one of the questions is what kind of quantities can we consider? Uh, one quantity we considered last year was left right two point functions. And you could consider something like this. And so, so given this state, this is a six point function. Of the because of the way the, the operators are inserted, this is an all of time order six point function, but there's some, some interesting features. And it has, a, has an interpretation, uh, at least in simple models, like the SYK model, this has an interpretation as the size uh, of the operator that creates this state in a precise sense. Um, so it will, if, if you sum over some set of basis operators, oh, you can compute this way the fraction of basis operators 
uh, that the perturbation has overlapped. So it makes sort of precise distinction. Um, okay, so that's just one thing you can consider. But today I'll talk about a simpler characteristic. Uh, I'll simply consider the space time volume. Collision region. So, uh, um, so, so we have a uh, setup from the beginning with the two perturbations coming in. And then there's a there's a some amount of volume in this post collision region, which characterizes. Uh, in a simple way, features of the collision. So, for instance, here there would be no such volume at all. And then you can ask how does it behave depending on the insertion time. Um, so, there's a volume of this post collision region. And the idea is that that is going to correspond to the number of healthy gates. So, that the number of gates that are unaffected by this perturbation in the overlap region of this corresponding circuit. So if I, if I draw this schematic picture, I now have two perturbations. One of them grows towards the right and at some point becomes large. And, and another one uh, Another one that's inserted on the left, so that's going to grow towards the right and grow large at some point. And the two have, have a certain amount of overlap. Okay, you, these two spreading uh, infections have, have a certain amount of overlap, which is going to correspond to the to the volume of the space time. I'm going to characterize what the volume is. The more, the more overlap there is, the stronger the gravitational factor. So, so that's the basic idea. And, and the, the, the point is going to be that this works surprisingly well. That this extremely simple picture of just two epidemics growing into each other tells you some, some interesting things about the ball. The space, the space time region in this, in this regime where gravity is very non -human. Okay, so let me that on this so we try to explain this so i'm going to consider the localized phase now uh so the the perturbations really grow like up here so you have two uh two insertions one growing to the left one going to the right and we have a space we have a local interactions in the x direction it goes up and each of them has a causal cone and a butterfly cone where the where the effect of the perturbations becomes strong. Now I'm going to ask how does this picture change as these perturbations grow into each other and their overlap grows? So the strength of the interaction in gravity grows. So this guy to the right and the other one to the left and ask about the way they can open up. And then You'll see that from this from from this very simple picture, there's four different regimes. Um, so 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 the first regime is when they will just start overlapping. There there is some overlap region now, uh, but both epidemics are very small in that region. They have not yet reached the butterfly cone. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on some particular X slice. And I'm going to ask as a function of this x uh, what's going on. So, so in this simple model, I can now count the number of healthy, healthy gates as a function of x and delta t. Delta t is the, uh, the time difference between the insertion points. So this, this regime zero to the left is basically there's no overlap at all. And then we would predict that in this first regime, uh, there, there's linear 
of the number of unaffected gates in the overlap regions. Okay, so it's linear growth because as you say, keep moving the, the green one to the left, this overlap region on a constant x slice will grow linearly. And this is going to happen until uh, until the this butterfly cone uh, spoils it. So, so I'm going to consider again some x slice here. Then once the butterfly cone enters into the causal cone of the red perturbation, then the, the, the amount of overlap here is not going to grow anymore. I'm only counting the number of healthy gates in the overlap region. So I'm only counting from here to until I reach the, the butterfly cone from, to, from the other epidemic. So here, here this will not grow anymore. It will, it will stay constant for some time. And then once both of the butterfly cones, well, it is not drawn very well. So this should be a constant x slice should go like this. Okay, so, so that both of the butterfly cones enter in this constant x slice, such that the amount of healthy region you have in the overlap is going to decrease linearly. And finally, when, when the butterfly cones overlap, there's no unaffected gates anymore in, the, in this overlap, once their amount is exponentially small. So this goes to zero. So, so we have so now we have we have two competing effects. Or or rather this, this very simple model predicts two competing effects in gravity. It predicts that in gravity there should on the one hand as we as we move the, the insertion points further down the Penrose diagram. Um, the collision happens earlier. And hence the volume grows. Volume goes up. Right? As I go from here, you know, say from the first to the second picture. So, but then there should be a second effect, that, um, which is due to back reaction. Somehow, if, if the if I insert the perturbation very early, back reaction somehow has to become very strong uh, such that the volume eventually stops increasing. It stays constant for a while and then it actually becomes very small. So, so there should be a competition between two such effects in gravity. And depending on where we are in, in this delta t time, uh, one or the other uh, will be or the balance here. It will make sense so far. I'm not on this crappy part. The time scales for that? The time scales? <clears throat> so, the, this would be the, the scrambling time of one of the solutions. The, the, the scrambling time of the green perturbation, which was my right guy. And then there's a time scale that's set by the scrambling time of the other one. So in order to get a constant regime, I need that these two scrambling times are different, which I can either achieve by making the perturbations differently heavy or by going to this higher dimensional case. And then here would be like the the, the sum of the scrambling time. Okay, so I've explained uh, a very simple model. And just by looking at these various cones, we make some prediction. Now, we want to test whether this makes sense, whether the prediction about the overlap of these perturbations indeed corresponds to the volume of this 
post collision region. Um, yes. So, so we want to test uh, test these predictions. So the, there are some simple tests you can do. So in general, the problem is that the post-collision geometry is not known. And at some point, the background action becomes very small, so it becomes a hard problem. So we can either do simple cases, or we can do some estimates. I can ask a question. So the first thing you drew was this case where the two perturbations hit the singularity before, you, before they can hit each other. That would be like the region zero here. Yeah. Uh, zero. So nothing happens. Yeah. And then regime one, they, they start back, uh, they, they start uh, colliding, but the back reaction is very weak, so we can basically ignore it. Okay, so, so in gravity, we can either do simple cases or we can do estimates, or we can also do a little bit of numerics. So the, the simplest case you can do is just spherically symmetric shocks. Uh, and if, in that case, if we want to see the regime number two, then we should consider the case where one of the uh, where one of the signals here is uh, much stronger than the other one. So. Yeah, so, so 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 we can work with this uh, BTC geometry, some horizon radius. That's kind of the important characteristic. Um, Essentially, what you do is you glue together uh, patches of such BTZ geometries along the shock, similar to what I drew in some points up there. Uh, the the post-collision region remains locally alias three, or, or remains of this form, and we get a from the collision we get a new black hole with a larger mass. So we just have to glue them together in a consistent way. There's some some matching conditions and so on. But this is well understood how you do that. And, and basically what you what you can compute is the, the horizon radius uh, after the collision compared to before the collision. Get some, some function that depends on the entropies of the perturbations and on the delta T. And from that, from that point of view, you can compute the volume. So that's a that's a simple calculation, and I, I might show a, a plot in the end of what the result looks like. But it basically just looks like this. So it, it has precisely the form that you would expect from this, uh, from this circuit analysis. So, so let's do something more complicated. Can consider localized shocks now. They are not very symmetric. And we can consider, to do that, we can consider planar ADS3, for instance. Most of the higher dimensions. So it has some, some simplifications here. And then, then we need to distinguish. Uh, early times and late times. So basically, when this the first effect or the second effect uh, wins. At early times, we can ignore uh, the nonlinearities. And simply pretend that the shocks can back react into each other. So we have a geometry. Um, 
The, the point here is now that two things happen. The first thing is that the, the intersection of the of this localized shock with the boundary uh, happens at the location of the causal cone. So, so it's as if you know, if I ask about this picture at some constant x slice, it's as if the, the shock comes in at a delayed time. So as a function of x, it's as if the shock comes in at, at, a, at an amount delayed by the x dependence, uh, where the, the, the speed is set by the speed of light, not the butterfly speed. And similarly on the right. And the second time that happens is that the, the shock wave surface is not exactly null. So the, the shock wave surface is, is like u. It's approximately at, at a well, okay. You, these are coastal coordinates, so you go in this direction, and it's characterized by u, which is also delayed by this x dependence. Okay, so the, the shockwave surface is not exactly null, but, but at the on the locate on the source, if x is x w r, then it is null, but otherwise. Okay, so, so effectively we have an almost null shock that comes in at a delayed time. And on constant x slices, the calculation then is the same as in the in this spherical symmetric case. Now, calculating the volume in this case, we, we cannot do that analytically, but because it's still this ADS3 setup, we can compute the volume numerically. And Again, I, I might show you a plot in the end, but it just looks like this. So the, the non trivial point that you can check in this early time regime is the fact that this has a, uh, that this has a unit slope, which is a manifestation of the, of the causal structure of these cones. If you're doing numerics, is the back reaction that much harder than higher tension? So when I say numerics, I just mean numerics and you're bound to the volume. I don't think numeric is solving that. No, not really. Okay. You get an equation for the volume. You solve it numerically, which is a little bit tricky, but that's what's for volume. And, and you find something that's again consistent with this picture for early times. So then you can make times. Yeah. Which is what uh, more complicated. Um, yeah, okay. So so how do we deal with that case? So if, if there's just one shock. We again have a, a, a geometry of that form. So I'm going to write down the, the geometry for a single shot. And sign the bar code. The x squared could also be higher dimensional. It could also be a hyperbolic space, but it doesn't really matter so much. So, what the thing is that the, this coordinate here jumps. Okay, so, just for a single shock, then uh, when, when you hit, if you follow the B coordinate, at, sorry, as you, as you follow the U coordinate, then at U equals zero, you hit the shock, and the B coordinate jumps. As in this picture out there, and the important quality is the amount, the, the amount of uh, jump you have. So that is 
exponentially dependent on the, on the insertion times. And it also depends on, on X in a butterfly velocity dependent way. Uh, okay, so higher dimensions are also dependent. Okay, the, the, the exponential is the, the important quantity. And this, this H of X, the amount of jump that you have in the, in the null coordinate across the shock, that controls the strength of the non of the nonlinearities in gravity. So if you have two shocks, then the important quantity is so there's now going to be two of these H's that describe the jump across the two null lines, across the two shocks. And their product controls the strength of the back reaction. So that's now to form uh, any of these perturbations and e to the delta x, which depends on x. So, so in these geometries, this, this controls uh, the back reaction at X or in, in, the, in the circuit picture, there's a similar quantity which tells you the amount of overlap you have between the two, two epidemics a given, a given X. And the target quantity that we want to compute is the volume of the post-collision region. Um, and we want to see the second effect over there, the back reaction brings the volume down. But since we don't know the geometry, we, we, need, we can just illuminate the, the gravitational mechanism a little bit by, by, by estimates. So the intuition is quite simple. It's just, uh, so I'm not going to compute the volume now of the post-collision region, but I'm going to compute an upper bound of the volume. And the reason there's an upper bound is just because of gravitational pull, essentially. So you can follow uh, a family of null rays along the So, so, so there's a singularity. This plus like one is at u equals uh, u times v equals one, and then uh, the, the two shocks go like this. So, so, the, so the post collision volume that we want is the as a function of x is the, the, the volume of this region here that's bounded by the two shocks and the singularity. Um, now we can consider some radial null lines k1 and k2 that originated this collision point. And we can ask about the affine time for these, for these null lines to reach the singularity, called that L1 and L2. Uh, we can we can normalize these things. Now, once once such null lines or a family of null lines, once they start to focus at all, then gravitational pull will just make them more, focus more. Okay, so the the volume that is measured by a co-moving observer here uh, will shrink, and that's the effect that gives a gives an upper bound on the volume of this region. So to make this a little bit more precise, uh, I'm gonna write down Wright Chaduri's equation, which which uh, describes the expansion theta for these two null families of null lines, K1 and K2. Um, Okay, so, so theta is the expansion of these null lines. And now, now the usual argument is that, let's say the, uh, the, the lines have no vorticity. Then for the spherically symmetric case, for instance, uh, let's 
So one thing that happens is that you would have a, a stress tensor with a delta function source. To this quantity h. That would cause a jump in the expansion times h1 of x across the shock. So, so as you cross the shock wave, the expansion becomes negative. And then Rachel Lewis' equation tells you that once it's negative, it can only become more negative because the derivative of theta only gets negative terms, assuming there's no. <laughs> Uh, geodesics. Now, in the localized case, they're actually not geodesics. Uh, so in that case, you don't have this kind of source, but instead you get a non-trivial term here, which has the same effect. So, so something different happens in the localized and respective symmetric case, but the outcome is the same. And then in the post geometry. This right to do equation simply reduces to the quality that we can use that says the expansion becomes more negative. And that, that inequality ultimately leads to a, a bound on these affine times to the singularity and hence a bound on the volume of that region. Okay, I'm not gonna try to derive that because I'm out of time, but I hope the, the intuitive argument makes sense. And I'm gonna instead uh, show you plots. Okay, so this is just uh, rewinding. This was the beginning. This is just the, the nicer version of what I do on the blackboard. Um, and the, the, uh, so the, the thick lines are what we get from these cones in the circuit model. And the dotted line is what you get from the computation of the BTC geometry. So you can see how it, how it matches uh, very nicely. And then this is what I call the numerics. <laughs> Which is, which is just to confirm that in the early time regime for localized shocks uh, in gravity, you, you indeed get this linear growth. Um, and then this is about what I was talking about in the end. So, so we can now consider localized shocks in planar, planar black holes. Uh, we can do different cases and different numbers of dimensions. And what I'm plotting now is, is the upper bound on the volume that I sort of sketched how you can get that from. From the right to do equation. And you can see that this upper bound on the volume uh, actually matches, again, matches extremely well. And especially in the late time regime, an upper bound is good enough because uh, the non trivial thing was to argue that this curve comes down, that somehow, even though the collision happens earlier, somehow the singularity starts to bend down and the post collision volume becomes very small. Um, so, so this plot. Yeah, and a slice of this plot at constant x is, is basically what I drew here. Now I included the x dependence, and you can see, uh, well, if you think about it for a little bit, you can see that this is precisely what you would expect from uh, moving these cones into each other in the, in the simple circuit model. And then you can do more complicated cases. So you can also get the similar bound and just plot it for a finite impact parameter where the, the localized shocks mi miss each other. And then, then you'll see how these, how these two wave fronts or what you want to call it, how they, how they start to move away from each other. Um, and you can do higher dimensions. So for instance, in ADS5 planar black holes, you get something that looks like this. But again, this is a plot of the of the volume as a function of x and as a function of the insertion times. But if you look at this plot from above, you can you can now pretty much see something that, that is essentially the structure of these uh, causal and uh, butterfly cones. But this is not so this comes from a gravity calculation. It's not this is not the circuit model anymore, but it looks precisely the same. And then just for fun, here's a a very complicated case, which I'm not going to try to explain. But so when you do higher dimensions, the thing that happens in higher dimensions is that the butterfly velocity uh, is not one anymore. So you see different cones. And then a finite impact parameter, uh, again, you see the effect from up there and, and how these effects interplay with each other. Um, okay, I think that's it. Like, well, right.
can tell you what else one can do. I mean, you know, let me let me cut it short. But maybe one one of the interesting questions is maybe how can you how can you get better resolution and and perhaps derive gravitational interactions more directly from this from this circuit picture because apparently it describes the, the back reaction very well. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Any questions for Felix? Well, let me start. Uh, so I, I was wondering in the beginning whether there's any kind of universality class of these circuit models, but uh, like for example, it's kind of arbitrary to divide the, the spins into pairs of twos, divide them into pairs of threes, and try to take some kind of scaling limit, which seems much more like a graph. You can, yeah, yeah, you can you can explore other you can tune the details of that uh, model and as long as you don't tune them too much you would expect it's going to behave similarly for instance if you're trying to get something that's similar to the SYK model then perhaps you want uh, interactions between more qubits at the same time um, Yeah, one can do that. But uh, so it's uh, the qualitative behavior is not going to change. Like the the, the effect uh, of curves like yeah. this is probably going to be it's, it's going to be a very small effect. It's, it's hiding in some. Yeah, I was more wondering about like the quantitative. Like for example, if you like rescale the time steps, but you change the interaction, it might be that there's some kind of universality, like quantitative. Any other questions? What's in Zoom? Okay. Uh, thank you, Felix, again.